Um, all right, everybody, I think we can uh, get started. It's our standard four minutes after the hour to start our uh, talks. And um, so I'm uh, Becky Shields of the Language Sciences uh, program here at UW-Madison. I'm very excited to welcome our speaker today. Um, first of all, I'd like to just start with a um, land acknowledgement, um, just to acknowledge that the land that we are, are now standing on, if we're here, uh, those of us who are here um, in person, um, it's ancestral Ho-Chunk land, um, and uh, to recognize that the Ho-Chunk have occupied this land since time immemorial. Um, and the indigenous name of this place, the original name of this place is De Jop, um, which refers to the four lakes that surround the place that we are um, standing in. Um, and we are very grateful to be guests on this beautiful part of Earth um, and want to uh, recognize the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 11 sovereign nations um, in our state. Um, um, sorry, I think I hear the... Um, sorry, there's a microphone beeping somewhere. Okay, oh. <laughs> um, sure where that is. Um, so... Um, this event that this exciting event that we have today is part of um, the Shachtin uh, Hultor Kaley or the um, Irish Culture Week that is happening at UW Madison and also UW Milwaukee um, this week. Very exciting, um, and we have in addition to the talk today, uh, we had a talk on uh, Monday by Tom Dubois um, on um, an Irish folklore collection. Um, the recording for that is available online if anyone missed that and wants to watch that. Um, and then coming up uh, tomorrow, there will be a talk by Karin Nikanshinli and Krina Nikarain, um, uh, both of uh, Belfast, um, uh, on the status of the Irish language in the north of Ireland. That will be uh, Thursday at 2.30 in person at UW-Milwaukee, um, but will also be available online, and we'll be having a streaming watch party here um, in Madison, if anyone wants to join us for that. Um, and then tomorrow evening, um, there will be uh, a beginner Irish language workshop uh, that will be Thursday at 6.30, um, taught by Ronan here. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning a little bit of Irish, uh, you're welcome to come to that. Um, and that's open to people who have no experience with the language. Um, and then of course, the big event that we're hyping up for is um, this weekend at uh, in Milwaukee, the Chunol Gedige or the Irish language gathering. Uh, which is taking place this weekend, Friday through Sunday um, in Milwaukee. And that includes all sorts of events and activities uh, associated with language and culture, drum making workshop, music, dance, um, and Irish language activities for all levels. So if you can make it to that, um, try to do that. And there's a couple things there that are online as well as being in person. Um, <clears throat> so um, our talk today, um, is with Ronan Odakherty from Glen Chalm Kille in Donegal. Uh, Ronan has a degree in Irish language and media from uh, Maynooth University. And he spent a year um, a while back as a, a foreign language teaching assistant here in the US in Notre Dame. Um, Ronan has actually been teaching the Irish language for a long time. He's been teaching with Edgescale for over 10 years. Um, and he's now back in his home native place of Glen Chalm Kille, uh, working full-time with Edgescale as their language director. He's been there since 2019. Um, in addition to the language teaching activities, he's a contributor to a whole host of digital and community Irish language projects. Um, these are just a few samples um, that in they include uh, the Gleish Research Group, um, the uh, Glen Chalm Kille Place Names Map, and um, the Portraits uh, of the Gaelic, so portraits of Irish um, authors. So um, we're very pleased to uh, welcome today uh, Ronan O'Dougherty. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, for people who are online. Um, <clears throat> by the way, we will be having question and answer period at the end of the talk, but certainly feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat as we're going along, and then we'll relay those to Ro Ronan um, toward the end of the talk. All right. Can you hear me at the back of the room there and online? I hope. And why? Okay, Shintawatuk. So, I'm going to just put some slides on the screen and hopefully it 
hopefully it all goes okay, though I did that the wrong way around to begin with. Uh, Anish. Okay. Uh, okay. Hopefully everyone can see that all right on Zoom. So Gurmila Mila Mayukovic, I feel really privileged to be here and to be doing a little bit of a, um, a Bit of traveling around the midwest um this couple of weeks and uh i guess a lot i see some familiar faces online and some familiar faces in the room and some people i've just met for the first time today and uh, i you may or may not be familiar that there, with the fact that there are quite a lot of groups and usually you know in here almost exclusively community driven groups doing a lot to learn the Irish language and, and obviously there are some degree programs in this neck of the woods as well or, or, or it's taught at university it's amazing for someone who grows up in Ireland and speaks minority language to see that and uh and it's a privilege to come and meet the people that are involved in it so um yeah I'm really um really happy to be here and uh Lord Show uh Banachti Saren. This is a little hello from uh Glan Colin Killa, where we're based uh from last summer. Um the, the people in the room here have had the benefit of uh leafing through the brochure, which some of you will know. But um I'm going to talk today a little bit about um Ija Scale where I work. And uh, I'm going to start off with some kind of uh, some introductions as I'm as I'm calling them. And I'm not going to assume too much knowledge because I know people have some background. So we're going to some introductions to the Irish language and what it is and its sort of place in the world at the minute, and also the area where we work and the organisation I work for. And uh, the sort of theme of the talk, and it's a real um, does what it says on the tin, tin kind of talk, uh, is um, the idea of talking about language revitalization, revitalization in the context of a minority language. And one particular approach to doing that, which is the sort of model that Idris Scale has, that is a, a social enterprise, um, a, a business that operates as a business, but is trying to you know, achieve certain aims, and in our case, particularly um, sort of uh, furthering the, use and preserving the heritage that we have because of the Irish language. So that's the general idea. So we'll talk a little bit about the Irish language and the kind of socialist linguistic context, um, talk a little bit about tourism, because we are a language school and we also work in what we call the cultural tourism sector. So we work in this area of tourism. And, you know, there's been a lot said in the past about the effects of tourism on, on minority language communities. We'll look a bit specifically about what Edge Scale does and uh, then we'll see chiefly much. We'll see if there's maybe anything that can be learned from this or any comparisons to be made or any way we can we can learn from each other a little bit. So so Erdus Marijerim, uh Kahan Ginaralta, um day talking about the Irish the Irish language. So we call it Gaelica. Um, so a lot of people I know in the in North America would be familiar with the term Gaelic. Uh, we tend to use when speaking English, we tend to use the word Irish. To us, Gaelic usually refers to Scots Gaelic, which is a sister language of, of, of Irish. Um, they all belong to the broad family of Celtic languages. There's kind of two major subdivisions of the Celtic languages. Um, they're sometimes called the Q Celtic and the P Celtic, but uh, there are the um, we have we have Irish. Scots Gaelic, Welsh, three existing languages that have been spoken to the present day. We also have Manx and uh, Cornish, which are languages that almost did or almost reached the point of extinction, but have been revived to a large extent. And then you have um, Breton in 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 Western in in Brittany or Western France today, and they all belong to the sort. Uh, broader family. So Irish is historically spoken throughout Ireland and large parts of Scotland. It was the same language until relatively recently, sort of famously, um, Irish uh, literature be would became very standardized in terms of its language very early on. And, and famously in the, you know, in the 14th century, a poet from the southern tip of County Kerry down here the to the north of Scotland that they would be conversing in the same language with their with their compatriots. Now, over time, particularly from urged a little bit, but Irish and Scots Gaelic would be relatively mutually intelligible. And certainly for the dialect of Irish I speak, which is in the northern part of Irish. Um, the other, there's more distance then to some of the other languages. 
But if anyone wants to know any more about any of these things as they come up, hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. But as I mentioned, Irish has made its way around the globe in lots of ways. And historically, it always did. Some of the earliest um, evidence we Irish and the writing of Irish is on the edges of manuscripts in places like Switzerland and you had all of these Irish monks that spread around the world and took their language with them and Irish the Irish diaspora and all the people who emigrated from Ireland brought the language with them right around the world to places like this and you have places like Beaver Island on Lake Michigan where Irish was spoken right into the 20th century so um so uh, yeah uh, uh, the language like the people um Get, get around a little bit. And uh, I come from, uh, a, and Igeskeil is based in this area, Glan Colum Killa. It was originally called Shan Glan, according to the stories in any case, which means the old Glen. Um, uh, but it was later named after St. Columba or St. Colum Killa. So a lot of people are familiar with St. Patrick, his big on the 17th of March. Uh, Ireland is said to have three patron saints, Patrick, Colum Killa and Breege. And uh, Colum Kill is a very interesting character, and he spent a lot of time in Ireland and in Scotland. And uh, that map on the previous slide is, they call it Cheer Colum Killa. Uh, Colum Kill is a great link between the different traditions and uh, cultural backgrounds in Ireland and Scotland as well. And uh, our, he is reputed to have spent two years in where I'm from and uh, the area takes its name from them. Uh, it's a small rural coastal area and scale is, imagining the scale is important in this talk, okay? The sort of parish of Glan Columkilla, where our main center is based, the population of about 1400 people, okay? And uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about minority languages. We're talking about small scales here. Glan Columkilla is a Gaeltacht area, which is an area where the Irish is spoken as a community language or has traditionally been done so but as we're going to see a little a little later on there are maybe different types or classes or categories of these irish speaking guilt areas uh, and then another introduction as i say it just scale uh, was we're almost 40 years old uh soon to have the 40th birthday next year founded in 1984 by Lee Cunningham and Joseph Watson um they were responding to a couple of things in setting up at your scale they were responding to a, a few challenges that we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in in a, in a little bit of time but the idea was that it was a language school that would help adults learn Irish and uh, Irish is part of the education system, at least in part of uh, the island of Ireland. Uh, but that did not necessarily always translate into creating Irish speakers. And part of the aim of Edge Scale was to provide adults with a way to come back to the language. Uh, and also, not just in the form of language classes, but provide kind of different methods and different ways to learn the language informally through activities like hill walking and traditional crafts and music and things like that as well. So you'll see a little bit. Of it. So we do education, heritage, and also cultural tourism, because uh, what we do is not just directed at the people that live in our immediate area. We really try to reach out to people who want to learn the language across Ireland and across the world as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But we'll take a, a step back uh, again for a minute, just especially for those who, of you who mightn't be familiar with the language so much, just to give a little bit of context and background uh, to the language. I'll just start with some, some fun facts, some claim, claims to fame that Irish has. Uh, it is one of the oldest written vernacular languages in Western Europe. The earliest Irish texts we have, some of them date from the seventh century. So at, at a point where a lot of people were doing their writing in Latin and Greek, uh, Irish started to be written down and partly because of that it has this huge literary tradition stretching back a very long time along with an oral tradition a very strong oral tradition of music and storytelling and all of that as well and uh, reaching back a little bit to what Tom was talking to you all about on Monday one of the largest in Ireland we have one of the largest folklore collections in the world in the National Folklore Collection in UCD and a lot of that has been digitized and made available online um Irish uh as I as I was pointing out earlier sometimes uh, people are not are not sure of its background as a language so it's a you know a distinct language and was the majority language of Ireland until relatively recently until the early part of the 19th century it would have been the majority uh, language of Ireland. Uh, it, there's a, a Nicholas Wolfe here in a book that was actually published here in Madison by uh, the, the 
the University of Wisconsin Press. He's a great book, An Irish Speaking State. And he estimates that there were over 4 million speakers of Irish in Ireland at the start of the 19th century. I would say it's quite a conservative estimate. It was probably much more like 4.5 million. But uh, that's what you're talking about. And, 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 I, and that was at the... That was at a point where Ireland's population was at quite a high point. You were looking at around 7 million people on the island. But at that point, English had started to take a hold as well. Um, that changed over time. We had a, a massive language shift in Ireland. And Irish point here, like all Celtic languages, is a minority language today. All Celtic languages except Welsh are endangered minority languages. But Welsh is a very interesting case and how they have, have managed to um, maintain uh, the, the, the use of their language. Um, and this happened for lots of, lots of reasons. Probably the biggest single factor was after the, the British colonization of Ireland. There was this marginalization of Irish in, in public life. It was removed from education, from uh, largely removed. There's exceptions you'll find, but it was largely removed from the education, politics, um, spheres of life and came to be associated with the poorer classes in Ireland and a lot of the poorer classes in Ireland were emigrating they were coming here or they were coming going to the UK or they were traveling to different parts of the world and uh, there was a perception uh, for good reasons that they needed English and there was the uh, the mentality of well what use is Irish is one that lasted for a very very long time well into the 20th century um and so by the end of the 19th century, by the, by the start of the 20th century, you find that Irish has become a minority language in Ireland. Uh, when Ireland got independence in 1921, a further complication happens in that Ireland was partitioned, okay? And something that's really worth bearing in mind, and I'm gonna point forward to the excellent talks that are going to come uh, from Colleen and Cleena talking about the situation in Northern Ireland. The other thing you have to remember in Ireland is that you have two political jurisdictions on the island. You have Ireland, often known as the Republic of Ireland, is the independent Irish state, makes up 26 of the 32 counties of Ireland. Northern Ireland, six of its counties, um, is, is within the United Kingdom. And that meant you had very divergent, differing situations and how the language, the experience people had with the language and the value placed on the language over a piece of time. So uh, to talk a little bit about the, the larger part of the, the country, um, going on the most recent census data, there was actually another census done since 2016, but it was delayed uh, because of COVID and the full results haven't been published yet. So I am uh, I'm working on the 2016 data here. About 1.7 million people in Ireland, okay? And there's about 5.1 people in the, 5.1 million people in the Republic of Ireland claim some ability to speak the language in, 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 in Irish. And that, it shouldn't be too surprising for reasons we'll see in a second. But in terms of a, as a living spoken language, probably the more important figure is how many people speak the language daily outside of the education system. Because as I mentioned, all children study the language in schools, but how many people are using it in their in their daily lives? And that puts the figure at something just shy of 74,000 people. OK, so population of 5.1 million, 74,000 uh, uh, daily speakers. So you have a you have the situation as minority language in Northern Ireland, where the experience was very different uh, and the way of calculating census data is different as well. So it gets a little hard to make comparisons. But uh, at the in the most recent census, which we do have data for in 2021, over 12% of people indicated an ability uh, to speak the language. Again, that's a bit vague, but they certainly are, are, are letting letting us know that they, they can, to some greater or lesser extent, speak the language and want to use it. And what's interesting and very positive in terms of the Northern Ireland experience is that's been increasing. So in 1991, it was, I think, just under 9%. So it has been growing slowly but steadily over time. Uh, Another uh, way, if they don't have the daily use of the language in the Northern Ireland data, but they had a question about what's your main language, which I guess is a way of asking of, you know, what language do you sort of live your life through? And uh, almost 6,000 people in Northern Ireland put Irish as their as their main language. So so again, that's uh, about one, I think it's about 1.9 million people in Northern Ireland. So uh, again, it's but given the history that's there, that's actually quite an achievement in a lot. The general experience, I think, general statement you can make about um, the Irish language in Ireland is that uh, there are broadly positive attitudes to the language, particularly in the South. Um, people are 
proud of it. They know it makes us unique in a certain sense. They know it's an important part of their history, of our history. Um, and that's true for certain sectors of society in the North as well and, and across different sectors of society. But of course, uh, the challenge that uh, almost all minorities face is that the language, using the language is not a requirement to live in the country. Everybody also speaks English. So it's very easy to get by without using the language. And obviously that, that, that creates a, a certain dynamic in terms of the use and the transmission of the language to the next generation. Just to talk a bit about this again, and as I said, there's another talk coming up in the series that will go into this in a lot more detail, but just about the differing experiences uh, uh, in North and South. In, in Ireland, in, in the South, you know, the language has constitutional pr protection. It is the first official language of the state, according to our constitution, and English is the second official language of the state. Now, most people who come to visit Ireland can find that a little bit disconcerting because it feels like you visit the country, it feels like it's the other way around. So you come to Dublin, you might hear a lot more English uh, spoken. But that was the national project, part of the foundation of the state. A uh, whole other talk on, on its own as to how that went. I, I would put it briefly by saying, I think an awful lot of the responsibility for um, continuing the use of the language was put solely on the education system. Um, and there was a sort of think that, well, we're going to teach it in all the schools and all the kids will learn it and they will grow up Irish speakers. But life is far more complicated than that. And you didn't sort of see this achieving this uh, monolingual state in the kind of time frame they imagined. In about the 1960s, official policy in Ireland really went more towards the idea of a bilingual. You know, OK, that Irish is a very important part of our heritage and we want to see it grow and become stronger, but just recognizing the linguistic reality a little bit as well. But we are really lucky. And the more I meet different minority language communities around the world, I really realize how lucky we are. In Ireland, we have a we have a, well, a, a section of a government department devoted to the language and to the Irish speaking area skills. There is a minister of state, a junior minister at governmental level who has sole responsibility for this. It is a core curriculum subject from the time you go to kindergarten to the time you finish high school, you study the language to a greater or lesser extent. For a lot of people that might be one hour a day, but you also have Irish medium education, which is about 8% of school kids in Ireland go to Irish medium education, Gael school, and as we call them, where they do everything except English, essentially through Irish. So, so that is a huge support. You have different state bodies um, tasked with language planning and uh, assisting uh, uh, economic development in areas where the language is spoken. And uh, more recently, we have uh, an official languages act, which is model to a certain extent or after what happened in Wales. So going back to that point, uh, trying to enhance the protection and rights of speakers to deal with the state in their own language. And um, that has recently been revised because it was brought in, I think, in 2012. Uh, maybe didn't have all the teeth it should have. Uh, we did get a language commissioner, which is sort of an ombudsman that if you if you 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 are entitled to deal with the tax man in Irish. And if you're not getting those services, you know, you have someone where you can kind of go and, and raise issues with. Uh, but it was recently, just last year, that bill was amended and was given some more teeth. And it will be very interesting to see how that progresses uh, in the future. We have a vibrant media. We have an Irish language uh, television station. We have several uh, Irish language radio stations. You have news media and everything available through the language. And uh, as of the 1st of January 2022, Irish became a full official working language of the European Union, which is a real uh, uh, status recognition for the language. And uh, there aren't a lot of other minority languages in the European Union as well. And I think that was that was an important development, which impact will be kind of realized over time. In the Northern Ireland, it's been a different experience. And I might be a bit charitable to describe it as a lack of state support. Um, uh, at times, the states, the way they dealt with the language was quite hostile. Um, and a lot of that has improved greatly since 1998 in the Good Friday Agreement, which, which was the major political um, resolution to conflict on Ireland, um, and has gradually got better. But I think I would summarize it as 
most of the achievements that have come about in relation to the Irish language in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the provision of Irish medium education, I think there's over 35 schools in Northern Ireland now uh, that work as Irish medium schools, kind of urban Gaelic areas, Irish language media, various other sort of initiatives. Most of that has been won by activism and community driven initiatives and uh, it's been hard fought for um, as well. Uh, there was an ongoing bone of contention uh, for, for quite a long time, since 2006, about an Irish language bill, something that wouldn't be entirely dissimilar to the Official Languages Act of the South. Um, and interestingly, politically, the, the political blocks to that, the opposition, largely came from within the Northern Irish state. For a long time, London and the UK has uh, has ceased being hostile to the to the what they might call the regional languages in in their domain. Uh, Welsh has for a long time had great protection. Scottish as well, and uh, London has probably been relatively supportive of 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 improving the situation of Irish in Ireland. But you have a you have a you have an internal political conflict in Ireland that has frustrated that at times. But uh, at the minute, looking better than it has in quite a while. Okay, and last point just on the language, I mentioned these Gaeltacht regions. So again, regions where uh, it's no accident that the green spots on this map tend to be on more so on the left hand side of the country, though there are some exceptions there in County Meath and Waterford. The language was very much driven back from the from the administrative centre of Ireland, which would be in the east in Dublin. Uh, and uh, the highest concentrations of uh, Irish speakers are often uh, in these areas, and these are areas where the language remains strong as a spoken community language. And uh, out of that 70,000 figure that we were looking at earlier, um, you know, you see about 20,000 of them are in these small, relatively small, small areas. They're important, I think, and it's very important to be inclusive of all speakers of the language, but the Gaeltacht remains important because it is part of that unbroken link with our linguistic heritage. You can fairly confidently stand in a Gaeltacht area and say the language has been spoken here for time immemorial. You know, we can prove that it's been spoken here for maybe 1500 years, but it's, you know, much likely much longer than that. And, uh, you know, as a, as a sort of that, 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 that culture and linguistic heritage, they're important in that sense. Um, in terms of um, Gaeltacht regions, a very important study was done with a really snappy title of a comprehensive linguistic study of the usage of Irish in the Gaeltacht. It's even snappier in Irish, I can tell you that, uh, in 2007, but it was a very important uh, study uh, of an assessment of what the state of the language was in these regions, because these are the regions where as well as being language, the community's language of the family, and you have the intergenerational transmission happening. And uh, they broke uh, the Gaeltacht regions down into three categories, okay? So you have A, B, and C. So A being the strongest types of categories, you know, the, the majority of the community use Irish as a community language. B being, you know, somewhere in the middle, English somewhat dominant, but there's a, you know, a large minority. And C, where Irish is a minority language, but at the same time, the concentration of Irish speakers is much higher than you would get in other parts of the country. And going back to personally, or what we are trying to do in a scale, in our area, Clan Column Killy, we never make no secret of the fact that we are in a category C Gaeltacht. We are in a Gaeltacht where the language is very much threatened and a lot of what we want to do is to try and turn the tide on that okay and I you mentioned uh, uh, everyone here loves statistics right so I mentioned earlier that we had the uh, about a population about 1400 so you're looking here at at daily speakers of the language in the three electoral divisions that make up that parish and uh, you know you're talking if you if you add them up you're talking on something in the region of something in the region of 200 daily speakers and Weekly speakers, so these may be, if you can imagine a family where maybe two people in the house speak Irish and three people don't, or someone who uses it in their work or, or uses it in their home and doesn't use it in their work. So this other category, weekly speakers, this is that in addition to those other figures, uh, you're talking like maybe another 150 here as well. So you're talking about 350 in total. Uh, so that's not far off that, uh, you know, looking at 40% percentage of, of, of 1,400, a little bit less in fact. Now, there, is a there are a lot more people in the area that have an ability in the language, but are looking here at actual use. So this is the challenge for us, you know, and this is what we're trying to address in a scale, uh, as well as trying to help people from all over the world who'd like to learn the language. Part of the reason we exist is because we want to, we want to help um, uh, 
improve that situation. So, in, in, and, and this is very much in an Irish context, um, you know, what are, we, what are we to take into account? It's a very complex and very nuanced kind of sociolinguistic situation. And it's confusing for people who come and try and learn the language. You know, you're trying to work out, well, where can I speak the language and where can't I speak the language? And, you know, so that is, that is a fact of it. There are many positives, okay? As I said, attitudes, very good. Uh, you know, Joshua Fishman had his criteria for what, what a language needs to survive. We have quite a few of them in, 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 in Ireland. We have good attitudes. We have state support. We have an increasing number of people learning the language. It's a part of the education system. So that's all good. But you've just seen there the scale of the challenge, particularly in passing on the language in the family home, okay, and continuing to produce native speakers of the language. And... Uh, I'm going to be outlining here part of what we did in Scale, but I would be stressing that it's just one response. We need a range of responses. There's all sorts of interventions required. And uh, I was giving another talk in, uh, in Celtic Junction in St. Paul on Monday, and I talked a lot about this, so I won't rehash it there on the off chance that some poor souls decided to watch both. But, uh, you know, and it just goes to common sense. I think the best efforts and initiatives that have succeeded in the Irish language are the ones that combine top-down and bottom-up approaches. You have communities looking to achieve things and you have the state either getting out of the way or actively supporting people in doing that. And as I say, it's just common sense, but, um, but I think that's worth bearing in mind here. Um, so I want to say a little bit about tourism because, uh, you know, it's a scale in a, long, in a lot of ways, we kind of straddle education and tourism. And uh, uh, I, I had another privilege last week. I was in um, Valencia in Spain, where they have Valencian, which is a language, you know, quite similar to Catalan. And uh, that's a that's a that's a community where you have a minority language that maybe has a couple of million speakers. Okay, or they're much higher, much higher proportions. And talking to them about using the language in the city, uh, you know, they were pointing out that. You know, there's still only maybe five or six places you can go out at night and 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 use the language. And he said, and like not only is not only is Valencian impacted by tourism being an important part of that city, but Spanish is. There are places you'll go and all you see is English, and uh, and tourism has always had a an uncomfortable relationship, I think, with minority language communities. You know, it, it, there is the potential to do harm because it may cause. Uh, and it does cause, you know, local, uh, the, the people in the areas that are being visited to question, well, what's the use of the minority language? OK, um, this isn't going to help us in our trying to economic development. Uh, maybe the tourists that are coming to visit, you know, see this language as a barrier and it, it doesn't help. It, it, it may cause them to not want to come. And all of that activity, how does that affect, you know, people interacting with each other in the community? The physical act of bringing lots of tourists into your area, how does it affect resources and how does it affect access to your own heritage resources? During the COVID pandemic, I remember having discussions with people on the Isle of Skye and Lewis and a lot of the islands off Scotland where, 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 where Gaelic would be a spoken language and they were inundated with, with tourists and there was, again, concerns about that as well. And there's always the thing of, the, we have this phrase in Irish, the couple of focal, which is the few words. And uh, there's always a slight tendency, or there has always been a slight tendency to use the language a little bit as decoration on things. So people make a speech and you have the, the cupola focal at the beginning, and then we switch to English. And, uh, you know, how does that help the, uh, you know, the actual use of the actual speaking of the language? So so those kind of concerns are in the background. Um, just a little view from Clan Colum Killer for you. Um, and I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go from that very general those general questions to um, specifically the development of tourism in Glan Colum Killa. Because uh, we're very lucky um, in the kind of resources we have. We have this rich heritage. We have uh, we have Neolithic archaeology. We have monuments dating to three and a half thousand BC in the area. You have this rich musical culture, you have the language, you have that. So we're where we've 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 really been privileged to have all of this. Historically, it was quite an isolated area. Okay, it was a it was you had to travel a distance to get there. Um, 
But particularly since the 1960s, that changed. And a very important figure in that locally was this, uh, this person, a uh, Catholic priest, J Father James McDyer, a uh, very controversial figure in Ireland at a certain point. There was a certain generation of people in Ireland who would be very familiar with him. He was described at one point as a Christian communist uh, because he, but the, his background was he had worked as a, he has worked as a chaplain in, in London uh, during World War II and had seen all of the Irish emigrants and uh, had seen the, how emigration was devastating areas. And he returned to Ireland and he ended up in Glanfollam Killa and he, he decided he was going to do something about it and started all of these economic initiatives, factories, tourism, things like this, to bring people to the area to build. And uh, what's a little bit interesting, so uh, there was a, a, a great uh, study done in, I'm going to hope, just changing screens here for anyone watching at home. Um, uh, the Open University made, a, made an excellent, put together a, a course, an anth anthropology course in uh, uh, they did these recordings in 1984, which was the year it scale was founded. And uh, they looked, they called it, um, they called it what they called society and tradition and change in Southwest Donegal. And they were looking at the impacts of tourism and economic development in the area. And they talked to Father McDyer and it's interesting to listen to his opinions on tourism and its effect on culture. Now, I would mentioned before you watch this it's very much of its time and there's uh I've maybe a view or two expressed in it that I wouldn't necessarily stand by myself but I think it's very I think it's very interesting to have a look at it so uh can you see that on the video give me a thumbs up if okay and hopefully you can hear it too tourism is particularly obnoxious oh. in obliterating uh we can't hear it here though can we culture <laughs> okay because to from a okay. this country or other country. And naturally, people in an isolated place like this are inclined to aid the tourists in their way of life and to value, and particularly in their mode of speech. The girl is here in charge of our folk who don't really tourists as they do. They have to converse in. So very gradually, they Irish spoken residue that they have here is becoming eroded through the development of tourists. Now, of course, it's a catch 22 question are you going to leave this into a sort of an Indian reservation and have no development at all, or are you going to risk uh, the language of the culture um, by having development? I take down heavily on the side of the latter because. I claim that if you didn't have development, you wouldn't have no people here at all. But I do think having got a certain amount of development going industrial wise and tourist wise, then you've got to like, work twice as hard then to try to restore the values that have been lost, and especially the values that have been lost. Now, for anyone watching on Zoom, I have a feeling you may not have heard that. But what I'll do is I'll stick the link in the chat before the end and you can watch it. Uh, uh, you can you can get a chance to watch it again, hopefully. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides and I'm keeping an eye on the clock here because I know time is skipping away on us. Um, OK, so. So, you know, it. so this is the questions, you know, does an influx of tourism, does it threaten languages community? But does, a, as, as stated there, does a lack of development also threaten language communities? And how do you find the balance, balance between them? Oh. On the zoo, yeah, two seconds. Okay. It's the jo the joys of technology. Okay, and now, Carcolor on way. Um, so with it just scale, we kind of tried to turn that question around. Okay, as can you actually structure things in a such a way that tourism is promoting the language and encouraging the speaking of the language. And it did happen in a very organic way. So like it, we started in 1984, Lehman Show started with a single course, 34 participants, and it slowly grew over time. Uh, we, from 1991, we had our own purpose-built center. Um, we got up to the point in the early 2000s and since where we have about between 
one and a half, two thousand people physically coming and visiting us every year. And obviously, with the start of COVID, since then, and this is of course how I met Becky to begin with, we, we started doing online classes, and uh, and that has sort of increased the population as uh, as well. Um, we have been successful in certain senses, and that I think over that time we've had several thousand people come to us and have gained a, a, a positive reputation to think. And I think there's a couple of factors in that. You know, it's a fairly unusual offering even still to have the language courses, all levels from beginners right to advanced, and also the cultural side as well, and the different methods to learn the language. You don't have to sit in a language class. You can do it in practical environments. Um, we really emphasize the spoken language and enjoying the language. The, the holiday part is in there, okay? Because Irish people have not always had a great experience in the education system. Sometimes they were learning the language without a context for learning the language, and we try and give that. Um, very important to us to have teachers and, you know, if it's the painting class, if it's the music class that you have, you know, experts and people who are practiced at doing this. And uh, two key things for us is that it's inclusive. And this is what really gives it to scale its flavor. We, 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 from the very beginning, welcomed everyone. In the 1980s, there were sectors of Irish society that would not have identified themselves with the Irish language. I'm thinking particularly of the unionist side in, in Northern Ireland. But Joseph Watson, one of our founders, who's professor of Irish in UCD, came from that background himself. And very much of the opinion that the language predates any religious, any cultural, any political divisions on the island, and that everyone has title to access. And that was probably the original motivation. But what was interesting then is, if you take that attitude, you find lots more people are interested. And nearly right from the beginning, the international interest in Idja scale was huge. Uh, to the point now where about 40%, last year, about 40% of the people who came to us came to us from 22 different countries around the world. And, uh, and that is interesting in a small rural area and seeing what people have. And many of those people reach uh, at a huge level of fluency in the language. So in terms of how do you get it right in terms of tourism, um, attracting the right people, and I don't mean the right people, but people who are genuinely willing to take part in the project who are there because they also want to help learn and strengthen and use the language. And that's key. And that sort of being inclusive is, is, is key to that, is key to that as well. Um, so this is what I'm talking about in terms of this social enterprise model. You know, Idja Scale is a business, okay, and runs as a business. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar to some greater or later, lesser extent with this idea that it sits somewhere in the middle between a traditional business and a, and a charity, okay? It's a, it's a business that is self-sustaining. Um, it's a for-profit enterprise, but it's mission-driven, okay? And it's trying to achieve some kind of a social goal. And what profits are made are reinvested in furthering those goals again. And that's, that's very much the, the model that we, that we operate on. And um, what we found is that it helps turn the tables around a little bit, you know? As I said, attracting the right people creates the right incentives. So if the people coming to us want to learn and use and practice the languages, the restaurants and pubs and B&Bs and accommodation know that they want to do that. And there's an incentive there for them to be capable of doing that. OK, now I'm not going to lie and say it's, it's always 100 percent as simple as that, but to a large extent that helps. You're connecting the language to economic development. OK, so we create employment in the area directly, but also in the summertime, in an area with 1,400 people, you take almost 2,000 more people in, and that keeps the restaurants and the pubs and everything business. There's an audience for concerts, for local musicians, things like that. So, And what's really good is that it's sustainable. So 1,600 people doesn't seem like a lot, but the people that come to do our courses, nearly most of them will stay for seven nights or more. So that translates, this is the argument I always make to tourism bodies in Ireland. So 1,600 people is 11,000 bed nights if you use the tourism term. And those people are coming. If they, most of them travel by bus, some of them travel by car. Even if they do, the car gets parked to one side and they, most things are in with walking distance. It's low carbon, sustainable, has less negative impacts on the community. And that 
supports us in trying to do other things for the community. So to have a facility year round, we're open year round, we're operating year round. In the winter, we're doing classes for local people in traditional crafts and basket weaving and tapestry weaving and in, in painting and different things like that. A space for events, cultural events, a meeting space, and that supports that being there. We um, are involving young people in the area, come and work for us. You, this is how I started. Use the language, get interested in the language, continue to use the language afterwards. And again, you know, your the perceptions around the language are linking it to positive development, to the interesting mix of people that come. We've had some high profile attendees. That's Ireland's current Taoiseach, our prime minister. Um, in the blue in the photo at the bottom, he's been with us before and quite a few. We've had Hollywood actors. We've had every sort of person coming to us too. And again, it just challenges what people think and their notions and their preconceptions around the language. That's not to say it's all plain sailing. Um, you know, translating those positive attitudes into people using the language in the home particularly uh, is not a, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. And we're still trying to find ways to do that better. Um, getting everyone to buy into that kind of goal and to not get buckled. COVID was a great example of this. COVID threw everything astray and really saw that before COVID, there wasn't much of Airbnb sort of culture in Glan Column Killa. Suddenly it became the done thing. And how does that affect the, the sort of the language networks in the community? So you have to you have to watch. And as a business that is working as business, we're susceptible to those things. OK, and and uh, that's something we have to bear in mind. But there's other sides to it, too. You know, by doing these things, going out there, putting out there's great serendipity that happens. And I can draw a direct line between a couple of things. As I said, the core business allows us to do other things. In the 1990s, we were involved in an EU project called Tapish Gale, where it was to uh, promote the art of tapestry weaving in Donegal. Uh, that was a huge success. The American ambassador to Ireland, Jean Kennedy Smith, she uh, opened uh, the first exhibition of that in Dublin. It travelled around the world, landed at Milwaukee Irish Fest, where we met a guy called John Gleeson, who was working and setting up an Irish department in, in Milwaukee. And uh, that was the start of our relationship with, you know, with the University of Wisconsin. And uh, things like that happen all the time, those kind of serendipity things. And uh, it involves being active, it involves trying new things, trying to innovate. Uh, time is against me, so I'm not going to read out the quotes here. A lot of what I'm talking about here is really summed out in a, a really two economists, uh, Irish economists, Finber Bradley and James Kennelly, have written a whole series of really interesting books. A, a nice, in a sentence, uh, this idea of capitalizing on culture, competing on difference, okay, that what you have and unique is can be something that's of value to other people and makes you stand out from other places as well. But as I say, I want to leave some time for questions. Another great example of, of the same approach, I think, is on Colleen Kuhn, The Quiet Girls, Ireland's entry and the first ever Irish language entry to the best international film in the Oscars in a couple of weeks time. And it's it's gotten huge uh, success as well. So right at the end, what can we take from all this? And of course, part of this is how do you define success? You know, in 40 years, we did not turn the language around completely and turn it into a 100% Irish speaking area. But I don't think that would have ever been realistic. Um, where are your buy-in and what are the parallels elsewhere? I was attended a talk uh, a couple of years ago, the guy called Cody Nelson. I don't know if anyone's ever come across him working with uh, indigenous communities in British Columbia. And uh, they have a thing there where they, they take two or three young members of the community every year and they pay them for a year to learn the language. And then in the summertime, they have summer camps and they help kids and uh, kids learn. And uh, what was interesting about that, he said, yeah, the point, everyone thinks the point is, so we have teachers to teach the language, but no, the point is in a language that has a couple of hundred speakers or less, every year we get three more fluent speakers of the language. And I always think there's that side of bit to edge scale as well. The people who are coming are allowing us to upskill our lo local people in the in the language as well too, but it's an uphill battle. So last slide. Um, so what I would say that what I'm trying to get our, across here is that, as I said, language revitalization needs a range of interventions. It needs state support. It needs private business. It needs social enterprise. This is one model, one way of doing it, but it can be a very good model, I think, in sectors that are potentially harmful, like tourism, okay? Because if you can tie the economic goals 
to sort of to sort of particular values, uh, it means the incentives are right. Uh, but for that to work, there has to be a clear community dividend. People have to see in the area because we don't. This doesn't work if the local community isn't buying into it. So it has to be clear what how it benefits the local community. And uh, I think the real unique thing about edge scale and I, the main thing I get across is that idea of inclusion you know I think a lot of things in minority languages cater to sort of traditional catchment areas for minority language and what happens when you reach out beyond those and you know are there people from the other side of the globe who might be interested in your culture and the, that shows the value you place on it and the things that happens that kind of those kind of synergies that happen afterwards can be can be quite amazing and uh, getting people involved, people that come to us, they're participants, they're not customers. I always say that, some of you might know it, we've been here at the start of every week. I go, you know, we're helping you, but you're helping us. And it's a it's a two way, it's a two way street. And uh, the sustainability side of it, good language policy is a, often good social policy. And it's very important in dealing with the powers that be, the state, the tourism bodies, things like that, to make those arguments in terms that they will understand. And that's something we've always tried to do as well. So, Sinead, um, I know that was a bit of a whirlwind tour, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask away. Right. Or maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds like a big number in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. No, it's a very good question, and I don't have, I don't have the answer. And there's a great study to be done there, probably, possibly the CSO are doing that. But, um, I would say there's a degree of honesty to it. There is a yes. Yes, I did attend school and learned the language for all of those years, but um, you know, I'm not using it in my daily life, so I'm not going to claim to do it. I, I would think for a lot of people, that is it, uh, because. But uh, it's interesting. It's it's very interesting, and there are, as you say, there's a there's a disconnect there in the numbers because there is a small small percentage of people who get an exemption or don't have to study the language, but that's a tiny percentage, and it's way smaller than what you're talking about there. So. Yeah, so I don't fully understand, but I, I would imagine it's a degree of people saying they don't, as you say, they don't have the confidence and they don't, they don't have the everyday use of the language, so they're not trying to claim that they, that they have an ability yet. I, uh, I see a question here from Colleen, Grumaika Colleen. Do people that live there year round feel invaded by the tourists? How do the locals feel about the tourists trying to speak Irish with them? Well, no, they don't. Like that's the that's that's uh, I, I that's a very good question, and that's what uh, we've always tried to be very careful about, and that's part of what I mean about getting the community to buy in. Uh, no, like the numbers aren't overwhelming. That's spread out over over a year. And uh, we're very conscious of the capacity we have and what, what we can and can't do. But it's something you have to be careful about. And uh, how do the locals feel about tourists speaking to them? You know, like 90, 95 percent time, like great to see it as a positive thing. But it does to local people. Some, if, if people come to our area and get a negative reaction from a local people, the reason it is, is probably it highlights to people occasionally if they lack an ability to speak the language and there can be a there can be a there can be a you know there can be a self-confidence thing that happens there but that's healthy too you know that's that's good and again that's part of what we want to happen we want to make make people think um. thank you so much for this occurring Donegal is a very special kind of Irish right so how does that get negotiated in that uh, speaking community with people who've been in school in Dublin or wherever? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, so yeah, for so for anyone who's not, there are there are three main dialects of Irish. Now, as dialects go, they're not massively different to each other. But if you are a learner, they certainly feel different different to each other. And uh, yeah, we've had a very simple policy right from the beginning. Uh, we we go after good teachers, and we do not worry about the teacher's dialect. So we have uh, we have teachers from Donegal we have teachers from down the road from us we have teachers from Cork Kerry we have teachers we have a guy who grew up in Long Island who is perfect Beto or Irish who teaches with us we have uh, people from another girl from Canada and same story and uh, we go after good teachers and when people come to us we go uh, the point I always make to people is you uh, it's a joke but it's serious I go well you want to be able to speak to more than one third of the people that speak the language so you you need to be exposed to other dialects and uh, for the locals it's interesting yeah because and but again that's healthy because it's exposing the locals to a broader range of dialects too and occasionally there's trouble and occasionally there's funny things that happen but but broadly it's a healthy thing and it's much less of a problem than people always worry on the first day about this and two days later they they're they're not paying too much attention to it Hey. So it's really interesting that you said you saw a lot of success in people just making it open and welcoming to everybody regardless of whatever cultural background or political leanings they may have or their ideology. So I feel like that's very different from my type of community. It's my type of community is a lot more very connected to culture, a huge emphasis on the spirituality of the people they use it. So I was just curious if you have um, maybe some subgroups that you set of people who still feel strongly about being connected to whatever culture or heritage, you know, whatever it may be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like that's 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 there as well. I suppose when I was when I referenced politic politics there, I, what I had in mind was very much this divide, particularly in Northern Ireland, of the of the Irish unionist side. And there, there was a very specific political context there of the people that identified as British, therefore wanted nothing to do with the language. And uh, and we were kind of trying to make the point that, well, you know, you can you can do both. You can you stay British, that's no problem. You can also learn the language. Uh, but in terms of the, the spirituality side to that, well, we, we leave it very open-ended and we let people bring what they want to that. So yeah, one of the features of Glan Column Kill is we have this thing called the Turris, which is a pilgrimage that people, don't, it's it's in honor of the Saint Column Kill. Uh, it's, it's relatively unique in Ireland because these were things that were traditionally done all over Ireland and most, mostly died out. Many have been revived since, but the one in Glan Column Kill has been observed uh, kind of, again, kind of unbroken without stopping uh, for as long as we know of. And, uh, people do that now like the traditional day to do it the 9th of june barefoot before sunrise if you want to be really and and it, it goes around all of these stations or sites of kind of spiritual significance and uh, i think it's a good example of the approach we take to it because some people do that really religiously and some people do that you know uh you know and, and the christian belief and they go around saying the prayers and they they do it in that sense some people do it in a spiritual sense but not belonging to it because they, they feel something uh, as part of it but uh not necessarily belonging to a certain religion and some people do it because they think it's a nice walk but like you know everybody is welcome to to take what they want from that and we're open to questions about that and and sharing that knowledge uh, with people and, and that's that's how we work it with the language and with lots of other aspects of society as well but but i think that i, I more and more that's a opposite in terms of learning from each other that's a thing I think, I feel our culture and a lot of cultures he here in North America can learn from each other as well, because there is a huge body of folklore talking about this to do with places and place names. And there was a whole branch of literature called Din Shanachas, which is sort of like the, the lore of important places. And all of these stories and knowledge associated with partic particular sites. And I see some parallels sometime, and I don't think we, capitalize on that if that's a poor word but we don't sort of um we don't sort of embrace that as much as we should in ireland and uh yeah it's interesting anybody falling asleep yet no <laughs>
Kawal na uh, the Dini Sawalia. Okay. Yeah, what there was um so there's a few aspects of that, but that particular thing, there's a branch of storytelling. A lot of it was written down, but there was an oral side to it too, which uh, would would be, they would be series of stories, sometimes like prose stories, sometimes like metrical, um, that would relate a whole series of events to do a specific place. And the sort of the point of the story, so to speak, is to tell you how that place got its name. But... Uh, that's, in a way, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is to learn all of the other information all along. And you'll find it tells the story of places, how it got called this, and then it got... I mean, in a way, that was a bit of an example I gave at the start with Shan Glan and Glan Colum Killa, the story of how Colum Killa came to uh, name, name, name the valley. So, and uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, philologists, as they were, and linguists have, you know, parsed all of this and kind of gone, yeah, that's not really how that place got its name. It makes no sense if, in a kind of historic linguistic sense. But these were these were story. It was a kind of storytelling, and it, and it was a it was a a rich branch of storytelling that people could. And on the inclusive side of things, we've done more and more with place names because we feel it's a very inclusive thing. If you stand anywhere in Ireland, you've got place names around. Or you know about them, you know that that the, you you can tap into that. So that's the kind of I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I've not been to a guest on region, uh, and I haven't been my friend called Killing Point. It's your organization, Urgent Square. Well, is that um, the the whole Gansak region there? Oh, that's a good like, question. We we are we are one of many. Uh, the so we we operate in Donegal in the northwest of Ireland. So yes, yeah, so the the largest Gaelic regions are in the northwest, in the west, and in the southwest. Um, there are there are some others as well, but so we are very much in the northwest, and even at that, we don't cover all of the northwest. Where our community, our parish in Glanfolamkilla, is is where we operate year round. We do work with some of the other communities in Donegal as well to do a couple of, I mentioned we are a category C Gaeltux, one of the weaker Gaeltux. For example, we provide courses every year in Tory Island, which is a category A Gaeltux, one of the strongest, one of the few places in Ireland you can go and you can more or less say everybody speaks the language. Uh, to to a really fluent level, and for the people that come to us, that's important because people come and they learn and they get to a point where they they want to embrace. So so we do that. But there are other organisations like Scale. Maybe not when we started, where there's so many, but there have grown to be more since. And so you have the likes of the Akadun Holskolyt Gaelge in Galway. You have Ira Corkagivne in Kerry. Uh, Gaelin, who have always been active, particularly with teenagers. I've got places so there are other organizations and i and i always stress we're all friends talking about this in business terms but you know it's not a competition there are there are far more people trying to learn irish actually than than we can we can all cater to so we do work together quite a lot and try and help each other out when we can yeah, yeah. some like they're not in your community so there are others in your work Yes, exactly. Yeah, and they do tend to. Yeah, so they they do tend to. There are particular organisations in particular areas. Yeah, you would be a uh, Connemara, which is uh, one of the larger Gaelic areas in Galway, would have a few organisations maybe working inside there. But just by virtue of its size, that that works pretty well for them. Yeah. Sure. It's a broad arm, but hard arm. I'm sorry, we're over time. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Peter, I hope Peter's still there. <laughs> um, Peter, uh, the sorts of language our shoots focus on. Yeah, that's a good, um, good question. So uh, that goes back a little bit to what I said, what Idge Scale was trying to do when it started out. A lot of kids learned the language this has improved greatly since i'm glad to say but if you go back to ireland in the 70s 80s 90s um the language is often taught as if it was being taught to native speakers so like you do in english in school you take it for granted that you can read a novel or that you can do things like that and a lot of kids were maybe sitting in dublin reading novels about 
a woman living on an island in Kerry to take a famous example that had that they weren't they weren't um, they weren't maybe they didn't have the ability to read in the language um, was not at all connected to their everyday experience of life and then they weren't getting to use the language outside of it. Um, so the idea from the beginning in Edge Scale is okay. It's not about grammar. It's not about writing essays. Uh, our focus, and still to this day, is on speaking the language because so many people that come to us, and it's even more true now um, with the internet. So many people that come to us are studying anyway, and they have the grammar books at home, and they're working hard and all this. But what they're lacking is the opportunities to practice and speak with other people, and um, so. Uh, so we really try and focus on speech and conversation and getting people comfortable and up to speed with uh, with doing that. We have particular courses that focus on particular things. We have a translation course and we have a grammatical accuracy course, but the vast majority is on that. And the courses are active, like um, being in a, you know, we, we, we were very much early on used what they call the communicative method in Europe. I'm not sure is that term used here as well, but you know, with that le learning languages by through exercises, group work, pair work, uh, and, and presenting kind of grammar and all that in the context when you need it. And that's very much been the approach we've taken all along. And we've been lucky to have great teachers and educators that have kind of helped guide that along the year, along the years as well. So Gurmike, Peter, thanks for the question. Thank you, Corona. Again, it was really wonderful to have you here. I um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, okay, Slán Gafol. And see some of you in Milwaukee and keep an eye out for the other uh, for the other online talks coming up here too. Why should?